Well, I should explain if anyone's confused that um, even though my last name is de Monchot, I'm not actually French. Uh, <coughs> my uh, great-grandfather was a French priest who went uh, to Australia on some kind of missionary trip and met my Irish great-grandmother on the boat, left the priesthood and had ten children. So, um, but nevertheless, I, I have spent a lot of time in, in, uh, in France, and I even learned French because it's very difficult to go to France with a name like de Monchot and uh, tell them you only speak English. So um, uh, it's a great pleasure especially to be, uh, to be at this event today, and uh, I look forward to um, many interesting conversations coming out of it. Uh, I am not, uh, I should also say, a, a scientist or engineer of any stripe. I'm a designer. I'm an urban designer. And uh, the work that I'm going to show you today is mostly focused on um, the ability of uh, data and information and what I would call uh, intelligent uh, use of data, maybe even smart, to um, not just give us cities that function better in terms of metrics like efficiency, um, but also, uh, uh, but rather, um, or, or as well, cities that exhibit the qualities uh, that Steve talked about, not just uh, resilience, but robustness. And I'm particularly fond of the definition of robustness that evolutionary biologists have, which is uh, slightly different from the one that Steve presented. And uh, robustness in their terms is not so much the ability to bounce back from uh, a crisis, which is uh, what, what they call resilience as well, but rather the, uh, robustness is in particular the ability to adapt to circumstances, uh, the specifics of which cannot be foreseen. So your ability to, to do something that you don't yet even know that you'll have to do. And I think, um, uh, if anything, uh, uh, describes the predicament of our cities as we enter the middle of the 21st century, the need to ensure that our cities can adapt to circumstances that we are almost by definition incapable of envisioning, uh, that is a particularly, uh, I think, pressing and urgent task. Um, and finally, the, the work I'm going to show attempts, uh, 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 last of all, but certainly not least of all, to imagine how data, and in particular the intelligent application of data to urban environments, can help make cities not just um, infrastructurally more stable, but that can also increase those crucial um, uh, parts of the urban uh, uh, metabolism, that is to say, social justice, well-being, and quality of life, something which I believe the French do know something about as well. So <laughs> let's, um, uh, let me show you the work. Uh, the, the, the project, um, uh, uh, which we called at, a, at its outset local code, is basically a series of design methodologies. and. Uh, a set of software tools that we have ended up writing ourselves only because they didn't otherwise exist. We are not primarily software developers at all uh, in a school of design, but rather the, I will show you the, cru <coughs> the, the crucial stages at which we've had to insert software into existing sets of packages in order to do the kind of work I'm showing you. The work is fundamentally a process of uh, the methodology is uh, a multi-stage methodology. It goes from identifying um, abandoned, underutilized uh, sites, uh, mostly so far in American cities, subjecting those sites to a kind of citywide or global analysis, followed by a site-specific analysis, which imagines how to accomplish certain city, uh, citywide urban goals um, with these uh, sites as the tools, and in ways that I'll show you in a moment. Um, then, um, uh, using what uh, architects are, are fond of calling recently parametric site, parametric uh, design tools uh, encapsulated in environments, for example, like BIM, when a BIM uh, package dis tells you uh, how many mullions you need in a, in a facade that you determine is a certain, de certain depth, um, that is uh, in some ways a parametric design process in that the software is not just drawing a drawing tool, but rather is actually collaborating in data intensive ways in the design process. Finally, we've um, worked especially with colleagues here at, um, uh, I should uh, have explained at the outset, I'm, I'm, uh, while I'm in the College of Environmental Design, I also work here with Citrus, and in particular um, the, with the Berkeley Center for New Media, with whom we've uh, uh, worked, uh, done in some initial work on how these kinds of tools can add, uh, uh, can aid not only in social justice in the design fabric of the city, but also in community engagement in the design process. And finally, I'll show you a range of design proposals that have come out of this methodology. One of the projects I was inspired by in this work was an artwork by the um, uh, architect-turned-artist Gordon Maddock, who 
between 1971 and 1973 um, took months to paging through microfiche to find 15 uh, vacant or underutilized sites in the fabric of New York City, uh, city owned um, uh, as well. Nowadays, of course, we can find 5,000 such sites in a few minutes with a, with a modern geographic information system, or GIS. And so the project is also, in some sense, a simple answer to the question, once we can see this territory, what do we do with it? Or what do we imagine we might do with it? Um, at least in this respect, New York is not unique. Um, we've uh, studied many other cities here in the United States, um, uh, aided by the, uh, generally by the openness of GIS data here in the US to, to find vacant and underutilized sites in Boston, New Orleans, Miami. We've worked recently in New York and Los Angeles as well. And in San Francisco, where most of the case study I'll show you um, uh, uh, this afternoon takes place, this is what these sites look like. They, they are kind of weedy alleys, no man's land, in between spaces, things that you might see, uh, or, uh, but not necessarily perceive um, uh, in the actual living fabric of the city. These kinds of sites become even more interesting when you overlay them with other kinds of public data. Um, the, the sites will be shown here in black, and when you look at other uh, um, uh, public data, like uh, from everything from respiratory health to the presence of carcinogens in the environment to reported crime incidents um, uh, to a variety of other social need indices, what you discover is a remarkable overlap between these sites and the city's social failures. Interestingly enough, these sites also overlap with certain ecological failures or opportunities as well, not only heat islands, but also, um, most prominently here in San Francisco, impedances in the stormwater system, even the presence of heavy particulates in the air, focused around the city's highways. Um, uh, and together, uh, uh, what we've imagined here is how these 500 acres uh, in the city, about half the size of Golden Gate Park, could be uh, potentially reimagined in this context or in any similar urban context as a new kind of urban infrastructure. The main tool to do this um, is the, uh, the, the site design tools that we've developed that connect globally scaled or urban scale GIS data to locally based design decisions. Here on a single industrial alley in the south of San Francisco, we have um, uh, a kind of simulation of the, of the analyses we do to each site one by one, um, uh, analyses of, of insulation, of uh, the presence or need for wind breaks to protect buildings, uh, the, uh, and most prominently here in the city, the uh, ability of each site to catch and, and uh, hold stormwater and thus significantly reduce the impact on the city's combined sewer system. The city, of course, already has programs that do this, and it also already has programs that allow the public to turn alleys and other spaces into parks, but what we're arguing for is a crucial connection between these two scales of effort, um, between community-scale greening and urban-scale infrastructure. Um, this is the work we've done, especially with, uh, as I said, the Berkeley Center for New Media, um, housed here in Citrus, on how a kind of layer of community engagement can overlap with these. And this, in some ways, is the most important visualization I'll show, which is uh, a simple um, uh, allotment of the existing funding that's dedicated to all of these, uh, to uh, infrastructural upgrades here in San Francisco, and how that money might be better spent, we argue, uh, uh, much more cheaply spent, to accomplish the same goals um, uh, on each of these sites. This is an, that was an, a, an apportionment of existing pools of uh, urban and infrastructural funding to each site based on each site's potential impact on uh, uh, infrastructural impact on the city as a whole. Um, uh, and I think this kind of um, uh, infrastructural thinking um, uh, at its core um, goes back to um, uh, what some of the other speakers in the session uh, reference, which is to the nature of the city as a complex emergent system in which any single intervention is unlikely to have the precise effect we might hope, but in which a whole manif manifold set of inventions can potentially um, even move us beyond uh, a kind of 19th century uh, biophysical metaphor in which the city has to have hearts and lungs and circulation um, and, and uh, potentially towards a more 21st century uh, urban metaphor in which a network of sites, a network of interventions have calculable, simulatable effects uh, on the city as a whole and thus um, uh, can help us accomplish some of these most important goals of rob robustness and resilience that um, Steve mentioned. That's the, the kind of um, site design process on each one of those sites. 
Now, um, I'll just quickly go through the um, last of my slides here. The, the software, um, I won't go through the actual technical details of the software we've written, but the most important thing that we've done or that we've aimed to do is to create a model for design practice in a data-rich environment in which design itself becomes a variable in a continuous iterated loop of simulation, modeling, visualization, community engagement, and the creation of geometry. Uh, this is uh, historically a linear process with enormous difficulties moving software and ge moving geometry and uh, materials, for instance, between a BIM package and a GIS package and uh, a rendering environment that can make it legible to uh, uh, potential users as well. And uh, I think at the most fu fundamental level of software architecture, we need to rethink these relationships if we're going to create the kind of environments that we need to. And so to summarize again, the, 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 just this particular methodology, uh, what's possible with this kind of thinking, a movement from the whole urban scale, from urban scale simulation and modeling to site level simulation and modeling to the generation of specific design proposals with specific ecological and thermodynamic outcomes, the engagement of, uh, of, of the community and an iterative design, uh, design process that can go back through all of these stages based on a variety of input and the final design proposal. This is a, a set of models we did for the um, uh, Venice Architecture Biennale of um, these proposals in San Francisco that were actually CNC milled out of uh, individual doors because we uh, left over door doors from abandoned buildings in Oakland as it happens because we believed we had to put our money where, the mouth, where our mouth was as far as reusing and uh, abandoned materials uh, as well as abandoned space. And those are the, uh, this is just a selection of these design proposals for San Francisco with the most crucial pieces of course not so much being the actual design geometry but um, the, the kind of locally optimized proportion of surfaces for each site, which is the result of our kind of globally scale database analysis, which is feeding directly into that design process, and also our simulation of what funding might be available for each site, given its infrastructural work, which also directly correlates to how much specific uh, uh, intervention, how much stuff we uh, can afford and therefore can build on each individual site. So uh, I don't know if I'm at my time or over it, but I'd be happy to take any informational questions now or start a larger discussion with my colleagues uh, in the panel. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. um, Omar Siddiqui with the Electric Power Research Institute. First of all, I thought your presentation was just mesmerizing, and it was fascinating to see things presented that way. I think the thing that struck me was uh, how you first you know, identified these kind of areas, that we call it urban blight, if you will. But the way that you overlaid, I mean, I was just sort of ticking off the list, sort of envir you know, overlaying environmental um, uh, statistics, public health, socioeconomic demographic. I mean, how difficult was it to, was that information easily accessible and in an open source format where you could put that readily into your database and... and uh, I'd say that the software translation is almost more difficult than getting the data. Getting the data in the, in the US, we're very fortunate in that a series of... Um, uh, uh, there's been a history of case law that's actually supported making data that tax money is used to collect accessible to the public. And I think that's crucial for, for this kind of work. Uh, I think that the, uh, that said, accessible is not always accessible, and therefore there's always a lot of data wrangling uh, to actually get things into unified formats to get things together. And this is where actually a lot of the, the uh, open source uh, GIS and data tools, although this work has been supported by, um, uh, by Esri, uh, we've moved uh, in, the, in the last year or two towards increasingly uh, open source GIS environments because that, that is the kind of, uh, um, the, most of the people we're dealing with who are collecting this kind of data are in that space already and it's, especially if we want these tools to be used uh, by designers, we're currently um, turning this particular workflow into a kind of web service that designers can connect to on their own desktop, um, that uh, then the open source tools are especially important because while we can access high level JS software here in the university, it's not accessible at the same level uh, outside. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.